police had uncovered the world's biggest ecstasy shipment. More than four tonnes of the drug, hidden in a container of canned tomatoes. How did Al Grasby get in this position? Look, all the indications were that he was on the payroll of the Mafia. Australia's Mafia, particularly a faction of the Indrangheta, has commonly been overlooked. Renowned Italian Mafia academic Anna warns that the political influence wielded by the Australian Mafia should not be underestimated. For those unaware, the secretive criminal organization is reported to be solely responsible for 70 to 80% of Europe's cocaine trade, as well as significant share in the rest of the world. Worldwide, the organization is said by authorities to boast an astounding annual turnover of over $60 billion. The Calabrian Mafia is widely regarded as Italy's wealthiest and most powerful Mafia group, with some officials calling it the most powerful criminal organization in the world, with an empire worth billions of euros. They've extended their influence and networks worldwide, including strong ties to outposts in Australia where they are commonly referred to as the Honoured Society, the Australian Mafia, or the Black Hand. In Australia, they are reported to be involved in trafficking cannabis and methamphetamine, as well as being reported to launder millions of dollars daily. On December 5th, 2021, arguably the most famous Mafia prosecutor in the world, 63-year-old Nicola Grateri stepped up to lead Italy's largest Mafia trial in three decades. However, this historic pursuit of justice came at a grave cost. For more than half his life, he has been living as a dead man walking, under constant police protection. I can't take five steps without an armored vehicle. My life revolves around protection. I haven't seen the inside of a cinema in 30 years. I don't go to restaurants, I don't go to the beach, I don't go anywhere. He revealed to the Sydney Morning Herald. However, despite all his troubles, he made it his duty to send a chilling message to Australians. The Indrangheta has influence over Australian council elections. In fact, they have bases in Australian cities that can control and move thousands of votes. I urge citizens to boycott businesses run by mobsters and politicians to be vigilant about their connections. Continue watching as we dive deep into the world of the Honoured Society, a Calabrian criminal organization that traces its roots from Italy to Melbourne and now operates throughout Australia. We'll explore its origins, its dark history spanning nearly a century, and how it now, according to authorities, may be setting its sights on dominating Australian politics. Our journey through time takes us back to December 18th, 1922, a significant date in Australian criminal history. The Italian ship, King of Italy, docked at the Western Australian port of Fremantle, before making stops in Adelaide and Melbourne. On board were three members of the Indrangheta, who would lay the foundation of the society's presence in Australia. These founding fathers included Domenico Strano in Sydney, Antonio Barbara in Melbourne, and an unnamed member in Perth. Through its early years, the Indrangheta's first venture was in the fruit and vegetable trade where they quickly gained a reputation for extorting farmers and demanding protection fees from market stallholders. This is how it worked. The operations of the Honoured Society within the fruit and vegetable industry were deeply entrenched in a system of mutual support and loyalty. Calabrian immigrants, especially those involved in the trade, received substantial assistance from the society, creating a lifelong sense of indebtedness. This assistance was not limited to fellow Calabrians. Individuals of Italian heritage, in general, were offered help if they adhered to the society's rules and guidelines. In return, members were expected to demonstrate unwavering obedience to the society's leaders, and any offense against a member was regarded as an attack on the entire organization, warranting swift and often deadly retribution. More importantly, the principle of seeking justice through government agencies was strictly forbidden. Instead, any issues or disputes were resolved internally, reinforcing the code of silence and secrecy. Into the 1930s, they successfully took over the Queensland's cane fields, marking the beginning of mafia-style corruption in Australia. That said, their success was not without bloodshed. The early years were marked by a violent clash between the newly arrived Calabrians and the already established Sicilian Mafia. Between 1928 and 1940, the feud claimed 10 lives, 
leaving a trail of bombings and homicides. Fortunately for the Calabrians, they had Domenico Italiano, who joined the Melbourne cell in 1930. He led them against the Sicilians and took over Australia from the rivals, eventually becoming the godfather with Barbara the Toad as his right-hand man and enforcer. As the decades passed, the society's grip on Melbourne's wholesale fruit and vegetable market tightened as they squeezed the life out of all non-Calabrian businesses. By the early 1960s, it was pretty much invincible. Not only was it making money from the food market, but it had also expanded its criminal empire into drug trafficking. The nine criminal families stood on top of Melbourne's underworld and were willing to flex their muscles through bloody violence to whoever opposed their rule. Unfortunately for the honoured society, being in such a lucrative yet vicious line of work, opportunists were bound to surface. It was only a matter of time before a storm of power struggles and betrayal hit. That moment came right after the passing of Domenico Italiano in December 1962. His death, closely followed by Antonio the Toad, Barbara's passing, both of natural causes, left a void in leadership that ignited a fierce battle for control within the ranks. Friends turned against each other, and with the slightest provocation, former allies would resort to violence. It was the killer be killed market, where the title of Godfather was the ultimate prize. Amid those struggles in 1963, Domenico de Marte emerged as the leader of the Honored Society. However, his ascension didn't bring an end to the infighting and internal conflicts. Many didn't respect him. To them, there seemed to be no better time to seize power than when the ruler was still young. Among those who sought change for their own selfish reasons was Vincenzo Angeletto. He was a skilled gunman and had recently migrated to Australia in 1951 to become a fruits and vegetable producer for the society. That said, he didn't like how the Calabrians did their business. Instead, he envisioned the honor society to mirror the powerful Sicilian Mafia in the United States, advocating for the inclusion of non-Italians in their extortion rackets. His refusal to conform to established rules fueled more tension within the organization. Furthermore, he defied market orders, refusing to sell his produce to designated wholesalers and went directly to the public. Angeletta's defiance didn't go unnoticed. He was once stabbed on society's orders, but still refused to return to the fold. Instead, he formed his own group of 300 members, known as the Bastard Society. Angeletta was a thorn by Demarde's side, but that wasn't enough to warrant his death. After all, he was still a member of the Calabrian Mafia. That said, this tolerance would last until the leader of the Bastard Society decided to sell his market garden to a Greek family instead of a designated Calabrian family. It's believed this decision turned him into a marked man. According to his close associates, it was around that time that Angeletta began carrying a pistol for protection. One evening in 1963, Angeletta met a tragic end as he sat in his car in the driveway of his North Coast home. Shot twice through the back window, his wife found him dead at the wheel with the car still running. His death allegedly came at the order of the Australian Board of Directors tasked by the Calabrian headquarters in Italy to maintain order within the Australian outpost, preventing it from splintering into chaos. It turned out Angelata's death would only further intensify the power struggle within the organization. His death triggered the market wars between the honored and bastard societies. One preferred the old way of doing things, and the other one thought it was far enough from home to do whatever it wanted. Members quickly picked their sides, and for the next half a decade or so, bodies dropped like flies. On a fateful day, on November 26, 1963, Demarde, the then godfather of the Honor Society, narrowly survived an assassination attempt. He was shot and wounded by a shotgun blast North Melbourne home at 3.30am. The shooters were believed to be two relatives of Angeletta, seeking vengeance for his death. Days later, Demarde decided to step down from his position in the Honored Society and Laborio Benvenuto took over as a new godfather. Laborio was described as a polite, charming, but shrewd leader who could shoot you with a smile on his face. He loved keeping everybody happy, but behind that smile was a decisive leader who would not hesitate to act if necessary. Interestingly, even through the bloodshed of the early 1960s, the Australian media remained unaware of what was going on on their own soil. The connection between the market wars and the Indrangheta was not fully understood at the time. This changed in 1964, 
when Victoria Police launched investigations into the Victoria Market mergers, which prompted the Victorian government to seek assistance from two overseas experts on Italian organized crime. The reports revealed the existence of the society in Melbourne and issued warnings about its potential future expansion into various industries. Roughly a year later, in 1965, Agent Brown's report, titled The Italian Criminal Society in Australia, highlighted the recommendations and warnings found in both reports. On top of that, it emphasized how secrecy and loyalty to the organization were maintained through intermarriage, and how little children were raised from birth to take mafia seats of governance. The Indrangheta's code of silence ensured their operations remained hidden from the public eye, all while they built a ruthless reputation. Surprisingly, despite seeking expert help, the government ignored and never released the recommendations of any of these reports to the public. After so much attention, everything sort of mysteriously died down. After years of relative silence, the honored society resurfaced with a chilling act of violence in 1977, sending shockwaves through the nation. Liberal Party anti-drug campaigner Donald McKay vanished without a trace in Griffith, New South Wales, the headquarters of the Australian Indrangheta. Investigators discovered bloodstains on his van and three 22 caliber shell casings scattered across the parking lot of the Griffith Hotel, where he had been having drinks with his friends. This marked Australia's first political assassination, leaving the nation stunned and fearful of the sinister forces at play. According to investigators, McKay's fate had been sealed when his name was accidentally leaked as a catalyst during a trial of four Calabrian men. These men had been cultivating a large marijuana crop near Griffith. Robert Trimboli, a wealthy and audacious man based in Griffith, charged with McKay's murder, managed to flee to Spain on his yacht named Cannabis. The Honor Society now owned thousands of Australian acres. The warning signs had been there all along, but the authorities failed to act, allowing the Indrangheta to diversify into drugs and other organized crimes. They then invested heavily into legitimate businesses to launder their illicit profits, further solidifying their hold on the Australian underworld. The public outcry following McKay's murder led to the establishment of the Woodward Royal Commission, aiming to uncover the extent of the Indrangheta's infiltration in Australia. This two-year-long investigation brought national attention to Griffith, where the society was cultivating vast quantities of marijuana among orange trees and grapevines. Once harvested, their illegal haul was cunningly concealed among boxes of fruit and vegetables, and transported to major city markets. At one stage, Godfather Laborio faced allegations that he was involved in moving marijuana from Griffith to Melbourne. As per the police reports, the intricate operation involved a truck driven from Griffith loaded with fruit and vegetables to mask the marijuana's presence. The truck would be parked in Carlton with the key left above the front tire. Smoothly, a second driver would then take the truck to a secret location, unload the marijuana and return the vehicle. The original driver would later take it to the market, further disguising the illicit cargo. Throughout the 1980s, the Honored Society's grip on Australia's criminal underworld tightened, expanding their illicit activities and amassing substantial wealth. Their marijuana dealings alone were estimated to yield staggering profits of around $45 million annually, transforming New South Wales into what the Australian authorities called a huge mafia corporation. As the Honored Society grew more vicious in the 1980s, they also became remarkably business savvy, amassing unprecedented power and control. Their monopoly extended to the point where they even began extorting supermarket giants Coles and Woolworths, demanding a 50 cents cut for every box of fruits and vegetables. Astonishingly, a supermarket spokesperson estimated that Coles was paying the mafia a staggering $6 million annually. In 1985, civilian Dominique made a fatal mistake by leaking crucial information about the society's members and marijuana plantations to the police. The ruthless Indrangheta took swift and brutal action, not only silencing Dominique, but also killing his parents in their Adelaide home. It would take two long years before Dominique's body was discovered, buried in a shallow grave within a chicken coop in Victoria. Nevertheless, despite all this, there was a silver lining for the government. After more than six decades since its inception, 
the Australian authorities finally got a chance to glimpse into the secretive world of the Honor Society. In 1982, Victorian police arrested Gianfranco Tizzoni, uncovering his role as the society's main drug distributor in Victoria. In 1983, he became an informant, providing invaluable information about the murder of Donald McKay and exposing the society's infiltration of policing, politics, and public offices throughout Australia. That said, a 1985 report by the Victoria Bureau of Criminal Intelligence put off any hope in the Australian government's efforts at defeating the Indrangheta. The report basically said there is nothing they can do about it. It read, Notwithstanding that the Bureau has identified many organization principles and members and activities, legal and illegal, it is virtually powerless to do more than reactively monitor. With that in mind, the circus of violence and intimidation persisted. On May 10th, 1983, an attempt was made on Benvenuto's life when his vehicle was blown up at the market. Though no one was injured, a shotgun was discovered in the car. Benvenuto claimed to have no enemies and couldn't fathom the motive behind the attack. You don't think somebody put a bomb in your no, car? No, because I never got a, no enemy. In 1984, the bodies of close associates Rocco Medici and Giuseppe Farina were found in a river, suspected by some to be retaliation for the earlier bombing. One of the victims bore the sinister mark of having his ear sliced off, a chilling warning to those who dare to listen and talk too much. Perhaps trying to avoid the infighting that almost killed the society back in the 60s, on his deathbed, Laborio anointed his son-in-law, Alfonso, as the next godfather. This was a big deal. To some, this was equivalent to God's blessing. Eventually, in 1988, Laborio died peacefully of natural causes, as the undisputed godfather of Melbourne. According to insider information, he had a son, Frank, but he did not consider him a worthy successor. Yet, just like Angeletta of the Bastard Society, the chosen Alfonso had an unexpected move for the Calabrian Mafia. It wasn't a mutiny against the Italian authorities. Instead, he declined the offer and added further insult by leaving his wife for a mistress. You see, there is an unspoken rule. As a Calabrian, you can be unfaithful, but you don't leave your wife, much less the former godfather's daughter. As things unfolded, Frank took up the godfather title against his father's wishes. Alfonso thought he was let go scot-free, but the Australian Crimean had other ideas. That said, they didn't act immediately. In 1990, the Australian authorities received their second biggest breakthrough when Pascal, a mafia boss turned informant, revealed Rosario as the de facto head of the Honoured Society. That same year, the Australian Bureau of Criminal Intelligence identified Rosario as one of the top 30 Italian organized crime bosses in the country. He was named by the Italian police for ordering the infamous Victoria Market murders campaign in the mid-60s, then under the order of Laborio, Frank's father. But looking back now, some investigators suspect that Pascal's surrender was the Indrangheta's attempt to get the police off their scent, potentially to cover something up. This is because around the same time, on the night of December 19, 1990, John, a Coles employee who'd been asking questions about these extra fees on the books, heard the bell ring at his home. Open the door, John called a voice through the front yard. He cracked it open slightly and was blasted with a shotgun. Although John survived, the company had to relocate him and six other employees who feared for their lives. Struggling to break free from the Indrangheta's grip, Coles and Woolworths, the supermarket giants, turned to businessman and football club president Frank Costa. The business pleaded with them to break up mob control by taking over the fruit and vegetable supply. Hearing this, the Honored Society offered $750,000 a year to leave it alone. And when he wouldn't toe the line, they threatened to kill him. And if you don't want that, you can have the other offer, which is a bullet for you. It turned out they weren't joking. Two years later in March 1992, Robert, the founder of a supermarket chain, was beaten to death in his North Coast shop and drowned in his own blood. The motive was assumed to be robbery. That same year, Alfonso's fate caught up with him. Then 39 years old, he was shot dead outside his Hampton home. Some associates commented that he chose a bullet over the crown, a grim reminder of the dangerous world he had been entangled in. Three years later, there were allegations that Frank had taken out a contract on Alfonso's life, but he was never charged. 
and detectives couldn't link him to the murder. That said, Frank took over Alfonso's fruit stall at the market after his death. In January 1998, the notorious Melbourne gangland war took center stage as the vicious killings flooded media stations. Slowly, the honored society crept back into hiding. It's interesting because while 36 men were murdered during this time, the society remained on the edges of the conflict. Perhaps other criminals knew better than to mess with them. However, in the year 2000, the honored society suffered a significant loss when Melbourne boss Frank was shot dead in the driveway of his home on May 8th at around 3 p.m. The mystery surrounding his death remains unsolved even now. Interestingly, a year later, on November 15, 2001, police offered a $100,000 reward for information leading to his killer. Several conspiracies have come up related to his murder. Some believe the society took him out to start over. After all, his father, the previous godfather, didn't approve of his title inheritance. Others believe he was just a casualty of war in the Melbourne gangland killings. That said, because of his death, one other thing also remains unknown. Who the new leader and godfather of the honor society is in this modern era. Between 2001 and 2007, the Australian Mafia yet again re remained relatively quiet. Until in 2007, when the Indrangheta was implicated in the importation of a staggering 15 million ecstasy pills to Melbourne making the largest ecstasy haul worldwide at the time. Concealed cleverly, the shipment drew the attention of Australian law enforcement. It arrived in Melbourne on June 28, 2007, triggering a joint investigation by Customs and Australian Federal Police. Intelligence provided by other law enforcement agencies led Customs officers to a shipping container in Melbourne, where they discovered the drugs ingeniously disguised as tomato tins. Upon closer inspection, Customs officers and Australian Federal Police agents found over 3,000 tins, each weighing approximately 1.5 kilograms, and containing MDA tablets worth an estimated $440 million on the streets. To maintain the investigation's integrity, the container's contents were replaced with a harmless substance and then released. In the course of the probe, a money laundering operation worth more than $9 million was uncovered revealing how the syndicate funded their illicit drug activities. Pascal, allegedly the boss of an amphetamine network, had his Griffith residence searched in connection to the investigation. A year later, in July 2008, another shipment container in Melbourne was found to contain 150 kilograms of cocaine. During the investigation, more information about the previous illegal shipment also came to light. Subsequent reports indicated that six snipers had been detached from overseas to eliminate Barbaro and an associate in their Griffith homes in New South Wales. Apparently, their associates in Italy suspected the pair had double-crossed them, even though the shipment had already been intercepted by the police. During the late 2000s and 2010s, there wasn't much information of what the Honor Society had done. Instead, it was being revealed to the public just how rooted they are in Australian politics. The extent of their influence over the years was becoming evident, and it raised concerns about their current activities. In 2009, Italian authorities disclosed their belief that Tony, the former mayor of Stirling in Western Australia, was associated with Giuseppe Comiso, the boss Saderno clan of the Indrangheta. Italian police claimed to have overheard conversations between the two talking about the Indrangheta's activities. In June 2015, a joint report by Fairfax Media and Four Corners alleged that Indrangheta ran a massive drugs and extortion business worth billions of euros in Australia. The report also raised concerns about the infiltration of politicians by the Calabrian Mafia. Furthermore, a court found evidence that suggested accused Melbourne Mafia boss, Antonio, may have ordered a $200,000 hit on a man he believed was providing information to a newspaper. In 2016, a report by Vice Media served as a stark reminder to the Australian public of the extent of the Honoured Society's activities. Between 2004 and 2014, the Australian Mafia accumulated more than $10 million in real estate and resources in Victoria alone. They were reported to be investing substantial sums of money into various businesses, including wholesalers, cafes, restaurants, and even a pizza chain. These revelations highlighted the significant financial power and influence the group wielded. 
posing a major concern for law enforcement and the public alike. Finally, on Tuesday, June 7th, 2022, the Australian Federal Police made a significant breakthrough with an announcement regarding Operation Ironside, the country's most successful international drug bust operation. During the raids on criminal homes, they uncovered not only walls adorned with the Godfather and Breaking Bad posters, but also apprehended 383 alleged offenders who were charged with the staggering 2,340 offenses. In addition to the arrests, the authorities successfully seized over 6.3 tons of illicit drugs, 147 weapons and firearms, and a staggering $55 million. This operation also provided crucial information about the Honor Society, a mafia organization that had long eluded them. The police estimated that up to 5,000 mafia members are operating in Australia, working in collaboration with their counterparts in Italy. According to AFP Assistant Commissioner of Crime, The Indragata are not just an Australian problem, they are a global problem, and they are flooding Australia with illicit drugs. They are pulling the strings of Australian outlaw motorcycle gangs, who are behind some of the most significant violence in our communities. In the weeks that followed that announcement in 2022, four more arrests were made, with three of those detained allegedly linked to the Indrangheta and accused of being involved in a plot to import a massive 1.2 tons of cocaine from Ecuador. These developments marked a significant milestone in the fight against organized crime in Australia. Fast forward to 2023, and the police are still doing their job. In February 2023, a staggering 3.2 ton pall of cocaine was discovered floating in bales in international waters northeast of New Zealand. Greg Williams, director of New Zealand's National Organized Crime Group, asserted that the shipment was likely destined for Australia, as Australia is known to consume drugs at 30 times the rate of New Zealand. Australia's drug trade is now reported to be intertwining with mainstream politics, raising concerns about what the future holds. Of course, only time will tell what is next to come. As always, please like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video and want to see more like this in the future. Also comment down below letting us know what you'd like to see next. Thanks for watching and have a good one.